I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Close your eyes. Sit comfortably. Put your feet flat on the floor. I'd like to ask you a question. What type of ancestor would you like to be? OK, open your eyes. It's a simple question, but quite profound. It's existential, some might say. One buried deep in our subconscious, but one that should also be grounded in our everyday existence of being a human. As the British-born eldest daughter of a Guyanese mother and a Nigerian father, the understanding of ancestry has always been central to my identity, my levels of power, privilege, and responsibility. As a black woman, my skin color is the first thing that people see before their mind runs to question my ancestry, my legitimacy, and the perception of the value of my contribution to society. And herein lies the reality of how our current version of society runs. The stories of a particular minority are used as beacons for us all, and then everything is designed to maintain that narrative. Narratives that are based on the beliefs and reinforce systemic biases and discrimination and imbalances of power. Those beliefs determine whose knowledge, whose wisdom, and whose technologies are deemed valuable. All of this based on how much it is worth to meet the needs of a global minority. I'm a lover of words, and I believe that language is a coding material for how we relate to and are in service to the other. It is my belief that many languages have been used to colonize, to marginalize, and denigrate the knowledge, wisdom, and technologies of those others. Take the word ancestor. When we think of the word, we don't tend to think of ourselves. We tend to think of in the past, of those generations who came before us, not the present or the future, and not about our responsibility to pay in that forward. The word ancestor actually comes from the Latin meaning foregoer, to proceed. So it literally means those that came before. And what that means is that we're always ancestors. And this should really be a part of our everyday behavior and understanding of what it means to be human in relation to other. And that's where we start, by remembering that our identities, our humanity, can only exist in relation to other. That I am because we are. Let me give you an example of what I mean. So let's look at the language and rhetoric of nature capital, which is usually defined as the nature stock of resources that makes human life possible. It was 17th century French philosopher René Descartes who said that we should become like the masters and possessors of nature. And since then, we've been obsessed with categorizing and assigning value to the planet's ecological systems based on our human wants, needs, and desires. Just take a moment to let that sink in. Think about the language, masters and possessors. When you take nature capital and you add extractive, if you take nature capital and add extractive measures of success and economic advantage, that's what you get. It feeds our egos. And when I say our, I'm not talking about many of the First Nations, First Nations peoples of this world who remember and acknowledge that this planet was here before us, who remember that we are the visitors, the invaders, the colonizers, the self-determined innovators. We are the data points changing behavior in unpredictable and chaotic ways, upsetting the interdependent relationship between animal, mineral, and vegetable. So. If, we, if our measures of success are skewed towards being masters and possessors of all that is other, then can we ever really navigate our way through and out of this current climate crisis? A 
a recent United Nations report says that we only, we only need to invest 0.1% GDP into nature to break down the ecolog ecological damage that we're doing to this planet. GDP is a skewed rationale in itself, and that number always makes me cry. 0.1%. 0.1% of the cheapest ticket to attend TED in Vancouver is just five US dollars. We need to remember that we are nature, and so our nervous systems are symbiotically connected to this planet. We need to realize that the value that we're assigning to our increasingly fractured relationship with nature is actually slowly dismantling and reconstructing our anatomy. What affects the planet affects us on a microscopic level and is increasingly impacting our mental health and well-being. And yet, we continue to innovate and to develop new digital technological solutions to mitigate the changes that we see occurring in our bodies without seeming to realize that what we should be doing is breaking that trauma cycle of cause and effect. Now, if you met my mother, she would tell you that as a child, injustice was the thing that would make me cry. I was, and still am, passionately curious. I'd always ask why. To those who knew me, I was a little social justice warrior in Afro puffs. Yes, this is me. Although I was considerably, considerably less talkative, I used to think a lot, but I now think that I'm probably playing catch up for that. I was afraid of what people would think of me, that I was weird or stupid for asking questions and seeking answers that what others never seem to do or to ignore. However, because of my heritage, I've also been curious into the ancient ways and indigenous cultures that had reverence for our reciprocal relationship with nature. It drove me, it still does, it still drives me. That curiosity has and always is still one of my superpowers. It's what has led me down a beautifully undiscriminating seven year journey that's led me to this stage. Seeking and recognizing patterns of merging the worlds of cyborgs and shaman and all of those who orbit them. The worlds of emerging digital technologies, of spirituality, of ecology, of sustainability, of quantum mechanics. Back then, I didn't have the language to describe what I was seeing. Often when I tried, people say, oh, you're too weird or you're too hippie. But much of the unraveling of our cultural, social, political, and economic norms over the last few years has provided me with the time and the space to uncover the language, to be able to develop a way to communicate what I was seeing. I've called it cyborg shamanism. Cyborg shamanism is a philosophy and a framework that is designed to spark a global movement, one of activism, of individual and collective transformation. It's based on five guiding principles and patterns that I recognize not only in the world of emerging digital technologies, cyborgs, but also in the worlds of the shaman and those where there is a reverence for our interconnected relationship with all that is other, with our environment, with nature. These principles help us to flip the script and establish new hierarchy of needs so that we can actually be good ancestors. I believe that cyborgs are very different than how they're actually portrayed on TV. To me, on a most basic level, a cyborg is about augmenting the biological with the technological. And so, glasses, a pacemaker, an RFID tag could make us all cyborgs. However, I think that we limit our understanding and acceptance of what technology actually is, which limits our potential to solve problems to innovate, to tell stories, to have accurate measures of success. And that's what this talk is about. In order to be better ancestors, we need to have new measures of success. And so, I use the word cyborg as a deliberate provocation to get us to think about what it could and should mean to be human. 
I use this, the word, I use it as a rallying cry for activism, to believe in something bigger than ourselves, whilst considering the ethics, power, and responsibility of what is possible and what we could and should be capable of. I use the word shamanism with reverence and humility. I use it as an umbrella term to acknowledge the ancient ways of recognizing and respecting our interconnected relationship with our home, the earth, and all of its inhabitants. I'm also talking about our ancestors, such as those of my own heritage, the Amerindians and the Igbo, of those of many of the marginalized communities of the global majority, those whose contribution to the very fabric of our intellectual, cultural, and economic and technological systems has and continues to be ignored, negated, and diminished, and devalued. Because our familiar relationship with all of life needs to be valued if we to ensure that one day we can be called ancestors. As I mentioned before, I'm a lover of words, but I feel there's been a loss of reverence for the many of the languages and storytelling frameworks present in today's world, which means that the stories of our ancestors and their deep relationship with all of life has and continues to be ignored, erased, reframed to present some other character as the savior. In 1949, American professor of literature Joseph Campbell created now one of the most famous and widely used storytelling frameworks in the world, The Hero's Journey. It's at the heart of most of our well-known stories. It was originally drawn from analysis of thousands of years of cultural, global cultural mythology. However, the conscious and subconscious intention with which it is now used has been subverted. It tends to present a cisgender white male as our hero. Many of us would recognize the names of some of those heroes. Luke Skywalker, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Sir Richard Branson. It's also interesting to note that most of those individuals would and could also be culturally and psychologically identified by the academic acronym WEIRD. Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Every day we consume their stories, and we use those individuals as, those individuals as our collective North Stars, but if we need further evidence of the power and the influence of the weird, then consider this fact. In the USA, 58% of the people who work in venture capital industry are white men, who control 93% of venture capital dollars. 93%. If you take that back to the idea of nature capital that I introduced you to earlier, then what we have is a master and possessor relationship with a planet that is dictated, governed, and evaluated by the weird. And that's where cyborg shamanism can come in, by helping us all to co-create new measures of success in the pursuit of becoming better ancestors. It forms the basis of the work that we're doing in our innovation lab, ISM.Earth, where we use the five guiding principles to run exploratory labs and co-labs and immersive and artistic experiences to help our clients, ourselves, to become better ancestors. So, what are the five guiding principles? Guiding principle one, leave. We have a problem. Each year, billions are spent with consultants to help us define, rebrand, and get around that problem, whether we call it racism, gender equality, climate change. The root of those problems is all the same. It's our perception of value. Our current measures of success are dependent on the tools and technologies that we use to try and address that problem, technologies that currently confirm our biased perception of value. What could happen if instead of focusing on defining the problem, we leave that old way behind and try and focus on redefining our perception of value? From one of master and possessor 
to one that reflects and respects the symbiotic nature of our relationship with all living beings. Guiding principle two, breathe. Our values are the basis of our guiding principles, our morals, our ethics, our culture. What could be possible if we remove some of the tension in our systems and give ourselves and others permission to breathe? If our values change because we now recognize the interconnected relationship between humans and other, what would happen to the who, what, where, when, and how we approach problem solving? What could we be capable of if we include those of the First Nations people and global majority as part of our guiding principles? How would this impact our capacity to innovate? Guiding principle three, grow. I mentioned before that I see language as a coding material and our behaviors, for our behaviors and therefore our willingness and our capacity to grow. I believe that our current definition of the word technology is reductive. It has become interchangeable with the idea of digital technology. I believe that technologies are tools that we use to connect with ourselves, with others, and with our environment. And if we understand this to be true on the most fundamental level, then we have an opportunity to truly diversify our approach to co-designing emerging technologies. It makes us step outside of our echo chambers to acknowledge that the ancient ways, such as shamanism, that recognize and respect our interconnected relationship with this planet and all inhabitants are also types of technology. How would this alternative view and relationship with technology impact our capacity to build equitable and inclusive futures? What would happen to that 0.1% GDP figure? Guiding principle four, flow. There is an, an anonymous First Nations quote that says, we don't inherit the future from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. And this is why I ask the question, what type of ancestor do you want to be? because we need to truly be responsible for the viability, the sustainability, and the ripple effects of the, what we are designing and unleashing onto and into the world. So, with our new values, our hypothesis for change, our relationship with all technologies, digital, ecological, and metaphysical, we will not just have a 180, but a 360 understanding of what is needed of us to become better ancestors. Our measures of success will change to become more equal and equitable for all life, not just human life. This then becomes our most basic hierarchy of needs, survival. Not just individual survival, but survival of our planet, of our home, of the Earth. I'd actually push this further to say that our measures of success should be directly linked to our individual and collective responsibility to the thriving of our planet. Because if we don't have a planet to live on, what type of ancestor can we be? Our resp one's responsible for the destruction of our home and the colonization of another planet. Which leads to our fifth and final guiding principle. Ground. How do we ground all of this down and turn it into something tangible? I believe that cyborg shamanism presents us with real opportunities to revisit the past, acknowledge the present, and the key word here is co-design the futures that we need to change how we interact with and experience the world. So, let our measures of success, our approach to innovation, our stories reflect the individual and collective consciousness of our responsibility to and our impact on the sustainability of the Earth. Let us move from I human to we human, to we kin, in fellowship and communion with all living things. Look, I've shared a lot with you today. But if you want to remember the guiding principles of cyborg shamanism, then remember these words. Leave. Breathe. Grow. Flow. And ground. 
because that is what, those are the steps that you need to take in order to answer the question, what type of ancestor do you want to be? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.